The memories of the events of Chaos Flame all come surging back to Subaru's still young mind. The events of the game of tag hitting him like a ton of bricks. However, his memories stop after his success in the 10 second loop. The door that held his interrupted memories refuses to open, and before he can spend much more time dwelling on it, somebody chimes in beside him. The voice tells him that he is lucky to be alive, and the proximity of that voice causes him to yelp. The childlike voice tells him to not be so afraid. He might catch the eye of the island's chief and cause a fight, which is an idea he doesn't inherently dislike. If anything, he rather likes it. In front of Subaru, who jumped to his feet without thinking and darted his eyes around, was a blue-haired individual. Subaru, lost and confused, asks who he is. The boy tells him that the question surpasses expectations, and after twirling around for a bit, informs Subaru that he has crossed the Black Lake and reached the gladiator island of Geenenhive. As if he were an actor on a stage, basking himself in a round of thunderous applause like it was natural, he announces his name to Subaru, Cecilus Segment. The name pings around his mind for a minute, and he frowns at the revelation. Cecilus is Valakia's Blue Lightning, the lead actor of this world, he proclaims. The name and title were consistent with what Super recalled, but the one thing he didn't expect is for Valakia's strongest soldier to be... a child? Super's physical strength since being infantilized had reduced significantly, but in terms of the ReZero world, it was but a small difference. His ability to conceive, think, and draw knowledge was weakening. Although he was using the same desk as before, his ability to open drawers was weaker and he was unable to reach drawers that were higher up. He thinks of the 10 second loop, and how if he were still Subaru, he might have gotten out of that a little faster. Something slowly welled up in his heart. The mixed feelings of relief and melancholy were a feeling more akin to homesickness. Before the infantilization, he would have been able to bear those feelings, but it seemed that this childish body had even lowered the bulwark that protected him against tearing up. He thinks about why Cecilius is unpopular. If it's because he's a child, then he gets it. Many adults would be reluctant to follow a child, no matter the strength. Cecilus tells him that he looks like he came to a conclusion, and Subaru apologizes for leaving him for a while, but he says it's okay. He's used to being left out. Subaru introduces himself as Natsuki Subaru before quickly realizing that he shouldn't have said that. Cecilus says his name sounds quite interesting, and he will call him it for now, until his mood changes. Subaru begins to think, is this really the Blue Lightning? Is this just some kid posing as him because they admire the name and title? He straight up asks him if he is who he says he is, and Cecilus bursts out laughing. There it is again, people always doubt him. Super refers to him as Sessi, and wonders if he is the friendliest man in the Empire before quickly shooting down that notion when he thinks about the people in Valakia that put up a front of kindness. Sessi is overjoyed to have a nickname, as Subaru asks if this is Chaos Flame, but no, quite the opposite. This is the entire other side of the nation. He thinks back to the words, Gladiator Island, and he recalls Al. Cecilos welcomes him to the Gladiator Island. It is rare that people that young come in, and even if they do, they don't live long, so he wishes him the best. Subaru's face contorts, yelling out that there must be a mistake, his voice cracking. He was in Chaos Flame, he can't be here, but he is, isn't he? Why was Cecilus in such a good mood in a hopeless place? He replies with a childish look in his eyes, saying that this is the end of the first act. He doesn't get it, but he was thrown here and had a fight to the death in a whirlwind of blood, so it's only logical that the story will transition soon. Cecilus also informs him, who he now refers to as Basu, that the person he saved also survived. His mind doesn't immediately drift to Tanza, but to Luis. With Cecilus' power and Luis' teleportation, he could escape. Before he could dream big of escape, Cecilus informs Subaru of the curse rule, as Cecilus smiles and guides him to the healing room. Subaru rushes to his companion, but why? Why is Tanza here? Cecilus asks if he did something again. He puts his hands to his head, anxious about her well-being, and he begins to panic his bloodshot eyes peering at Cecilus, saying he has to get them out of here. Contact someone. Since he was one of the Divine Generals, he might listen to what Subaru has to say. That was truly nothing more than a notion from a childish way of thinking. Say, Basu, what are these nine Divine Generals you're talking about? Cecilus had become completely unaware of the concept of the nine Divine Generals. Any notion that this boy was the real Cecilus had vanished. He was just a prankster, a boy who cried wolf, a fake Cecilus. So that's where you've been segment. Subaru spins his head to the entrance of the healing room, and an unthinkably large man sits in the doorway. Not only was he tall, but he also had a thickness to him both vertically and horizontally. His neck and limbs were as hefty as a log. Cecilus refers to him as Gustav, a large man with four thick crossed arms. Subaru had heard of this tribe of people from... from... oh, right, Wilhelm. Cecilus informs Gustav about Subaru's journey, and he thanks him for the refresher, but he says that he had told Cecilus to tell him when the boy had woken up so that they could continue their talk anew. Subaru says that he is, uh, Natsuki Schwartz. Gustav and Cecilus lament that Tanza is not awake because there is time in the schedule currently. Gustav looks to Subaru and tells him that you must participate in Sparka. Very few come here willingly, but it is his duty to bring order to the Gladiator Island, which holds outlaws. The Emperor's wish is to transform this island into the most meaningful bloodbath in the Empire. That declaration 
was so awfully emotionless that Subaru's blood ran cold. The hue of Gustav's eyes, the way he spoke, they both seemed cold and unwavering, but that would be mistaken. There were more appropriate words to describe Gustav. He was robotic, inorganic, and cold. He calls down to Schwartz again. You cannot refuse Sparka. If you do, Segment's plea is rejected, and you will be thrust back into the Witch Beast Lake. The giant of a man would tell a child that refusal meant death. That was what it meant to be cold-blooded. Weren't people usually kinder to children? Or was it acceptable in the Empire of Valachia, where the strong were revered, for children to be killed without pause for the sole reason of being weak? If that is the case, a nation like this must be destroyed. Subaru mutters under his breath. If he did well in the upcoming battle, he would become a slave. If he did not, he would be fed to the fish. Subaru had thought that nothing good had happened to him ever since he had been made smaller, but he had to correct that. Not a single good thing had happened ever since he had arrived at the Valachian Empire. He hates this place. Despite the amount of gazes pouring down on them, there was little commotion. Numerous people around him curse. A scaly-skinned lizard man, a bald-headed man with tattoos on his body, and a young man with a pleasant face donning long, rust-colored hair. They all hailed from different backgrounds and races, but they all had one thing in common. That was that they disregarded Subaru when it came to manpower. As Gustav thanked everyone for attending, the gates of the passageway that brought the warriors to the arena opened. A horrifying apparition slowly emerged out of the darkness. A face of a lion with eyes colored red, four hoofed legs like those of a deer, with twisted horns and fangs. Its body made even Gustav appear small. As is desired by His Excellency the Emperor, prove your prestige as strong citizens of the Empire. This was the barbaric trial to become a gladiator. The men that Natsuki Subaru had been stuck with were not excited to be with a child. And even worse than that, they were frustrated due to fighting with a trio, when this was supposed to be a five-man team, as Tanza still remains asleep. The Lizard Man begins to panic as the Guilty Loaf stands there. But the Rust-Haired Man tries to get him to collect himself pointing over to two swords in the arena. He tries to calm the man's nerves by informing him that he is a warrior. Only one of the swords is viable, but when it starts, he will go for it. As Sparka begins, the rust-haired man doesn't even get the chance to rush towards the sword due to getting kicked in the face by the tattooed man. The lizard man clings to the wall, changing the color of his scales to blend in with his surroundings as he shouts that he doesn't want to die. Subaru's face goes pale. What can I possibly do? However, the beast remains standing where it had started. The tattooed man pulls the sword out and turns towards the beast. And that is when his face was blown off without mercy by the lion, with a swipe of its paw. Subaru's throat hitched, and he cursed himself for not realizing sooner. The lion had gotten up the very moment the hilt of the sword was grabbed. For the lion, that had been the true declaration that the event had begun. It then begins to charge towards the wall of the arena, towards the lizard man. The headbutt crushed the lower half of him, causing the contents of his body to spill out like a frog ran over by a car. The rust-haired man looked into Subaru's eyes and told him to stay behind him. How many humans could put on such a brave front and face their demise head-on? The man, devoid of weapons, devoid of comrades, could only hope to at least face his last moments with integrity. The lion then rushed towards them both. As he pondered what his friends would do, Subaru's shoulders were grabbed and thrust forward. The rust-haired man shouted that he didn't want to die. Subaru's body was quickly shredded by the ramming attack. His insides had been scattered into tiny pieces. I made a mistake, he shouts. Me being a warrior was a lie. I was just trying to seem important. Let me out. That is when Cecilus calls to Subaru's body. He calls himself someone who was not a good judge of character. Is there anything you want me to tell Tanza? I thought about how story-like it would be to pass it on. Thinking back on it, his attitude had never changed. Not when Subaru woke up, not when he and Subaru talked, and not when Subaru was about to die. He felt that this insane view of life and death was an element that made the fake Cecilus seem a tad more authentic. I hate it. The Empire. I really hate it. Holding tightly onto his resentment, he cursed the fake Cecilus. And then, he was swallowed whole, head first. Subaru resets to seconds before Sparka is declared, as the thoughts of his body being destroyed, the fear of being chewed up, and his reckless anger towards reality came back to him. He could hardly stand straight. They began to talk about the sword again, and the rust-haired man calls himself a warrior. That's a lie, Subaru says. You're just downright lying. The man bites back. Are you intending to insult me because I called you a child? Lying and trying to make yourself look like a big shot is a much greater insult. In a situation like this, what's the point of playing the tough guy? The tattooed man grabs the rust-haired man by the collar, as Sparky is declared. The tattooed man's fingers are bitten off, as the lizard man repeats his actions of hiding along the wall. Subaru's knees trembled at the situation even worse than before. What unfolded was almost identical. There had been no significance in calling out the man's lie, but Subaru had done it without thinking. Tattooed man tells Subaru to pick up the sword if he wants to live. He will draw its attention, and Subaru must throw the sword to him. He says that he doesn't want to give up, and the tattooed man compliments him. His name is Waits. Subaru ran with all of his might towards the sword, prying it out of the rust-haired man's dead fingers, and turning to throw it to Waits. As he does, he is confronted by none other than the Guilty Low. Instead of instantly annihilating Subaru, however, it lifts its hind legs to kick Waits. His face was smashed to bits by its hooves. Cecilus calls down, 
Basu, can you recover from that? Awakening any hidden power or seal technique? Subaru says he has nothing like that, but he wants to ask him one question. That lion, why didn't it kill me earlier? Well, because it's a beast. A beast hunts by instinct. If you were a beast, who would you aim for? Subaru understood. And then he heard the sound of his own body being crushed by the massive lion. Ever since Chaos Flame, Subaru understood the importance of a mere few seconds. Those ten seconds of hell. Understanding permeated his body. Subaru calls out, telling Waits to hold that guy down. Subaru's tiny hand grabbed the sword lodged on the ground with force as he yelled out, If Basu were the beast, who would you aim for? Those words of Silas had been painfully seared into Subaru's brain. Indeed, he would go for the dangerous one. Subaru gritted his molars and faced the howling lion lunging at him. He had a visceral shudder of fear, but he would not be defeated. He would not run away. Don't think that just because I'm a kid, I'm going to cry and give up right away, he shouts. Cooperating with a coward, a scaredy cat, and a fraud, with all of his might, with all of his power, with all of his body and soul, he would fight through the sparker to the bitter end. In that decisive moment, the lion's powerful paw ferociously reaped the life of Natsuki Subaru, along with his third attempt. Before we continue, I wanted to point out a few things. Cecilus in Phase 6 sets an interesting clock for Subaru. Uh, we don't know when, why, or how he got infantilized, but we can assume that it is longer than Subaru has been infantilized, and we can see the damage it has done to him. He no longer has any recollection of the Divine Generals despite him being the first, and throughout the prior phases we see people like Wilhelm and Beiko slowly slip from Subaru's mind. The state Cecilus is in sets a clock. It sets stakes for infantilization. Obviously, it was already pretty bad that he was weaker than he already was, but by losing the things he has going for him most, his connections, his loving friends and his memories, he is slowly losing himself. I also want to bring up the name Natsuki Schwartz. Uh, in the earlier phase videos, I had discussed the implications of the Natsumi Schwartz identity being one of confidence of perceived strength by Subaru because he felt that Natsuki Subaru couldn't be the hero that Rem deserved. Of course, there is an in-universe reason for Natsumi Schwartz's existence, but there is also the pretty explicit subtext of it. And I think the same could be said for Natsuki Schwartz. However, it is a bit more implicit. By combining Natsuki, his family name that holds a lot of personal significance to him, and the high expectations he felt by being related to Kenichi, and Schwartz, his idea of power and confidence, that can meet those high expectations. He's being the halfway point between Natsuki Subaru and Natsuki Schwartz, the combining of ideals essentially, but still not quite Natsuki Subaru. And we see that here with Subaru refusing to give up, and while it's not necessarily a healthy mindset at times in this phase, it's pretty raw, so that's cool. An abominable technique left behind by the vicious old man, Olbart. By meddling with the ode of others, the shinobi's secret infantilization technique could remarkably reverse the growth of one's body. All living beings were not more than the containers for that which came into existence from nothingness, the ode. Depending on the shape of the ode, the size and the form of the container would vary accordingly. Therefore, all living creatures would don different appearances and establish themselves as unique lifeforms. Olbart discusses his technique, stating it is one among several dozen. The actual result and effects deviate so much. He was sure that it would just shrink someone, but it goes as far as to restore the brain to its youthful state. Just as your body shrinks to fit the ode, so too does your brain. Anger simmers up within Subaru, scorching his soul. There was fear, there was also tension. Furthermore, there was also unease. He possessed every negative emotion, but all of those emotions blazed, burning through every carefully folded and wrapped up thing until not, without exception, remained. His raging anger surged up. Subaru tosses the sword to Waits as the rust hair man yells out that he should have it. Subaru yells out behind you to the man known as Hyane, or the lizard. He looks behind him, instinctively extending his tail and clogging the rust-haired man in the head with it. The lion then charges at Waits, and Subaru yells at him to crouch, sliding below the beast's belly, letting go of the sword to dodge the hit. It lands in Hyane's arms, who turns away from the lion in fear and begins to run as fast as possible. Subaru runs along the wall to a lever inside of it, jumping up and pulling it down with all of his weight. Gears were interlocking, and the sensation of something beginning to rattle and move sent a tremor from under his feet. An iron fence rose from the ground. It was a wall that had been raised to divide the circular gladiatorial arena into two semicircles. It was possible to force the line onto the other side. However, this time, he had failed. He had corralled it onto the wrong side, and because of that mistake, the lion had Hyene's remains in his mouth. At its feet lay the mangled body of the rust-haired man. The beast standing proudly on his corpse, fracturing his skull. Unable to climb the fence, it turned its gaze towards Subaru. The way it stooped down made his skin cross it charged at him. Waits called out to Subaru. It was something he always did. Of course, only when he did not die first, while also keeping that at the back of his memories. Next, Subaru howls out. In another loop, Subaru tries to work with the rust-haired man, Idra, but he just isn't strong enough to pull the big sword out of the ground. He yells to him, You're the heir of your noble father, are you not? Those words bring strength back to Idra's eyes. The man was no warrior, nothing of the sort. He had drifted to the Gladiator Island due to the inability to pay his debts, a debt he had taken on to protect the business he had inherited from his father. 
The untalented son of a miller and Subaru both applied their weight to the large sword. The lion was coming at them from the other side of the fence, and behind it lay the corpses of Waits and Hyene. Even so, Adra did not abandon Subaru and run away. This was the first occurrence of that. The fence broke, and Idra managed to get the tip out of the ground. He hoisted over his shoulder, and Subaru helps push the sword to make it lighter to swing. The obvious strike, however, was repelled by its claws without a hitch, and Subaru and Idra were both immediately blown away. Next, Subaru mutters. Anger simmered up in Subaru, scorching his soul. Waits would say that he was desperate for food, so he stole. He made them think that he was dangerous to avoid deadly situations. Hyane would shout that he isn't going to be used anymore. Idra would mutter that people he trusted deceived him, stole his family business away from him, and he became a slave. Next. Next time. Next time for sure. The contradiction of accumulating deaths in order to survive amassed more and more. It hurts. It's difficult. It's scary. It's tough. I want to stop. I want to cry. I want to shout. I want to grieve. I want to scream. I want to give up, but I won't give up. Out of those endless possibilities, crushing the paths which led to dead ends, he would twist his small body into that path unknown, laying ahead of the ones crushed. Waits, Hyane, and Indra would die. Of course, Subaru would die just as many times, and yet he raised his head still. Even if his body was bathed in death from the assailant claws, Natsuki Subaru still refused to desist. Because he will not lose. Because he did not feel like losing in the slightest. We cut back to Olbart discussing infantilization. Even if the mind shrinks, the effect is only half as powerful on those whose resolve was unchanged from before. Of course, they are easier to kill. That is the worst possible scenario with this technique. When the guy gets more dangerous when shrunk. Scary as can be, right? That outcome? It was way too ironic. It had transformed Natsuki Subaru's body into that of a child, regressing what little intelligence he had already possessed. Natsuki Subaru was around 10 years old, to the time that he had been a child prodigy. Young Subaru felt that he could accomplish anything. In accordance with his growth, his self-esteem wore down in the face of reality, and ended up being lost altogether. The moment he was at his lowest, he was transferred to another world. After that, his encounters, his experiences, and his conversations, his actions gradually wrapped Natsuki Subaru with new desires, and had also led him to the assessment that his own perseverance was not a bad thing. And yet, he was still insufficient. His heart still lamented so. Never knowing defeat, never knowing how to give up even when his dreams did not come true, even when he did his best but it could not reach, he never knew those. From just being insensitive to being flat out reckless, he firmly believed that he could accomplish anything. He recklessly believed that he was the ruler at the center of this world. He firmly believed that he could accomplish anything. He's that guy's child, after all. In a country he hated, joining forces with comrades he had little emotional attachment to, in order to return to the place where his friends were, what point was there in hesitating? Therefore, this time, because he had been summoned to another world, as the strongest existence, Natsuki Subaru would trample Gienenhive. Ten-year-old Natsuki Schwartz, I feel, currently does not possess the mental facilities to process what is happening to him here. Phase 6 does not exist in this vacuum of Subaru dying over and over to achieve his goals, it exists in the story of ReZero, that is regularly reinforced that exhibiting this behavior is toxic to his own well-being, to care about himself, to consider himself among those he wishes to save. So, when I'm reading about Subaru becoming an improbable monster due to infantilization, or the strongest existence that will trample all over Gienenhive, I'm not thinking that he doesn't care or anything, I'm thinking that something is fundamentally wrong with Subaru, especially ever since Return by Death broke and the 10 second loop and I do not think that he is fully capable of grappling with the situation at hand here. This didn't feel triumphant to me, this was just brutal. This also reinforces my points earlier about the mixing of identities. Kid Subaru who had no confidence in his ideals, no sauce, no bitches, but upon becoming Natsuki Schwartz and a little bit more mental regression, he becomes a bastardized mix of confidence, heroism, immaturity, and regression. In the same phase that Subaru mutters that he hates the Empire, he recklessly believes that he was the ruler at the center of the world, because that was the kind of boy he was. The idea of Subaru trampling upon the others, that he is the strong trampling the weak, sounds like in this childlike state that he has succumbed to the way of Valakia while damning its very existence. I'm very interested to see the future of Subaru in Arc 7, and I assume Arc 8. Subaru resets, and resets, and resets. The trio had the opportunity to ignore the boy, but considering his instructions saved their lives from the beast many times, that freedom was closed off. It was as if their unit was a single living being with perfect coordination. Just what are you aiming for? The crowd pondered about the boy. With deaths piling up and the pain and fear compounding with it, his arms, legs, and internal organs were all shriveling up. If he shut his eyes on the back of his eyelids, the face, the fangs, and the inside of the mouth of the lion he had seen up close so many times would come to mind. Unfathomable fear manifested. Though, while seething, together with it came something. Anger. Hyane tosses the sword to Waits, who narrowly catches it. For the first time, Everyone was alive, and the position was ideal. Waits readied his sword, and Idra and Hyene ran to the large sword. 
Then, Subaru too ran with all of his might towards the wall. The lion charges at weights, and if he were to stay here, he would die. Subaru was certain that he had the courage. He pulls the lever with all of his weight. The iron fence thrust upwards and struck the lion's head from below, crashing into his jaw. The fence was squashed by the impact, and the lion gets back up, trying to break through the fence. Hyen and Idra both wielded the large blade. With all of their might, the large sword swung by two men fell directly overhead onto the lion's neck. The lion shrieks echo into the sky. It rejected death, violently struggling, as Hyen and Idra applied their weight onto the sword. However, just like them, the lion did not want to die. It wraps around to swipe them off of it as their bodies hit the ground. Subaru tried to jump onto the blade, but he was far too light compared to them. A paw swung back at him, but it was skewered by weights. Hyen and Idra get back up, leaping onto the sword Subaru dangled from, slicing deeper into its neck. Even after trying, and trying and trying, and finally being just one step away from reaching it, he could not reach it. That is why, next time, he won't lose. But the next moment, the lion's thick neck was chopped in one swift motion, and Tadza asks why she is in such a place. Gustav then declares that they are accepted as members. The crowd cheers for the group, and Tadza asks who Subaru is. There's a lot I want to talk about, but let me just rest for a bit. Gustav narrows his eyes at the now unconscious boy, not expecting he had the ability within him. Turning to Cecilus and asking if he went to wake up the girl, he replies, you don't have to ask if you know the answer. It would be unfair to fight with four to five people. Upon Subaru's awakening, he learns of the destruction of Chaos Flame. He immediately wants to go and help, and Tanza pulls him aside for a second. This person alongside them looks exactly like Cecilus Segment, the blue lightning of Valakia, who has tried to assassinate Yorna in the past. Subaru whispers that you must be a really horrible person to want to kill Yorna, and she agrees. He is an atrocious fiend. Despite their age difference, this Cecilus acts exactly like the real one. Perhaps they are siblings. Cecilus reassures them that he is an only child. The basis is simple. If he had an older brother, then his dad would have gotten him killed when he had him. If he had a younger brother, then it would be strange if his father hadn't gotten Cecilus killed. Subaru has no fucking clue what he's talking about, and he can't help but think of the idea that this is an infantilized Cecilus. He files two segment theories, the shitty brat theory, where he is just a copycat, and the shitty old man theory, implicating Olbar in his current state. With that, the trio of kids finally heads to eat. He sits with weights in them, and he has given a plate with meat on a bone. Idra bows his head slightly towards him, saying that they are fine thanks to him. Tansa says that everyone believes Schwartz had done a great service, therefore, they have decided to prepare a treat. After surviving Sparka, everyone in the unit got a feast, and Idra thought it would be strange if Schwartz didn't get a share of it. He also thinks that it's strange that Cecilius is here, and not with his unit, but he replies that everyone died but him, and he is already a gladiator who gets allocated solo deathmatches because he is the strongest. Cecilius wanders off like a lost child, and Subaru is left to think about Gustav. He has no intention of staying here, leaving today or tomorrow, even if it means being hostile to Gustav. Subaru asks if they can do this without him, and Hyen asks, are you planning on leaving? He replies, rather, what if everyone else could escape as well? Before he could continue that train of thought, people gathered around Subaru saying he put on a great show. They warned him to stay away from Cecilius. He did nothing and watched as his unit was annihilated. Then, after all was said and done, he finally stepped in to kill the beast. After that, every time he was assigned a deathmatch, he had the nerve to cheer his opponent on till all the others were dead. Then called himself by General First Class. I obviously want to bring up the very strong Al and Subaru parallels in this phase. It doesn't really need much explaining. A looper is on Geenan Hive, and the only way they can survive and save the people around them is through hundreds if not thousands of deaths in extremely strenuous situations. I also think this further speaks to Subaru's current mental state, as Al is not necessarily the perfect depiction of sanity or well-being. Having himself killed, was it like thousands of times to convince Priscilla not to go to Valakia? Subaru being the strongest existence is actually scary for his enemies and to himself. A few phases ago, Subaru speculated about how he would act if he lost a limb compared to if others lost a limb, and phase 6 Subaru is the answer. Recklessly. Another thing, uh, if return by death being broken equals shorter loop windows, uh, I wonder if there's any possible speculation that return by death has been failing since early arc 5? The first loops in Arc 5 were his shortest loops at the time, and they continue to either stay that small or get even smaller into Arc 7. I've always thought it's just been broken just in Arc 7, but I think this is something interesting to think about. It also gives us a further idea about Al's envy factor being broken in some way as well, but that really could just be how his authority works. Just an idea, I'm not really sold on it. Life on the Gladiator Island for Subaru was not that bad. Everywhere he went, he would receive the same reception he got in that large hall during dinner. Tanza is the only person seemingly criticizing Subaru's decisions, attacking him for spending days wandering around talking to people, but he bites back. He can probably use his head better than her. Cecilius comes running down the corridor. The drawbridge is going up. New people have arrived. Subaru says that in order to get off this island, there are two things that will become their obstacle. One is the drawbridge, which connects the two pieces of land. The second is the curse rule. Subaru, Tanza, and Cecilius arrive at the observation deck. Hyen is also present. 
At first, the rattling sounds of gears and moving parts could be heard. Before Subaru's eyes, the drawbridge rose. What had appeared slowly was the drawbridge that had been submerged deep within the lake. The carriage pulled by a huge gale wind horse had finished crossing the two-kilometer bridge. Hyen's eyes widened at who exited, saying, They got caught? The people brought in were much like him, lizard men. Even though they went as far as to use Hyen as bait to get away, they wound up the same. Hyen yells out that it serves them right. Ended up making fools out of yourselves because you took advantage of me. Ridiculous. Seals closes one eye at his words. He is surprised and impressed because it is a mediocre statement by a mediocre character who exists just to be beaten. Why do side characters sound like side characters? You'll find if you look through nearly every story, you will find there are many members of their cast. The famous ones say and do things worthy of their renown, and those who don't say and do things that are worthy of their stupidity. Weak people say things that seem weak. Strong people say strong things. Hein turned his back to run away, but Subaru called his name. What about the people down there? They shared their food with you, didn't they? The last thing you remember might be a bad memory, but it's too lonely to think that the last thing you saw of them makes up everything about those people. This kind of thinking is actually exactly what I talked about in my Phase 1 video if you go back. Uh, Cecilius' mentality here also really feels like a reflection of Subaru's NPC thoughts in Arc 1, and now it's quite ironic what he's about to do uh, compared to what he did at the start of the story. Anyway, Subaru thinks that there was a saying that a person would show their true colors in extreme circumstances. How ridiculous, he wanted to say, to tell him to discard that logic. It was ridiculous to assume that, when a person was placed in an extraordinary, uncontrollable situation, the actions they took would determine everything about them. Then, would what Hyane, Whites, and Idra have done during the spark be their true colors? Would that be all there is to them? If you talk to them, you get a different story. Hyane calls him creepy, always talking as if he knows it all. They'll never get past the spark anyway, so it's impossible. He then leaves the deck. Tanza tries to make Subaru focus again. Cecilia says that it is rare we get everything the way we want them. There is a precondition for those beings who obtain everything. The qualification of being the chosen leading actor. If you do not possess it, and you want something you're undeserving of, Subaru cuts him off. What if I do? Cecilius kneels down to Subaru, saying it's easier to have things move along if you think of them as what needs to be done, whether you like it or not. Accepting what is in front of you as supremely natural, coming to the conclusion that you can't change destiny. Those who cannot overcome obstacles with their own strength will stagnate on the road ahead. You have no choice but to carve your own path. Is that why you didn't help the others, he asks? Sassy tells him that you must be able to clear obstacles by yourself. If you accomplish things by borrowing the strength of others, you won't be able to overcome the same thing the next time you encounter it. You can't borrow power forever. People die eventually. You say that, Sessi, but sometimes encounters can change a person. Then, that changed person might overcome that next obstacle. Besides, you say to treat it as what needs to be done regardless of my feelings, but it's important to keep this feeling of not being able to do that. This feeling of not being able to throw away my personal feelings to do something is the driving force to save someone else. Even if I'm told that this is the selfishness of a naive brat, because that's what it is. Hearing Subaru's declaration, Cecilius puts on a big, satisfied grin. That fits his logic as well. Cool people say cool things. That is the very spirit of someone who rebels against fate. Quickly heading back into the island, Subaru calls out to Old Man Null. An old man with a thin body, an untended long beard, and the impression of a cotton swab. He asks the old man if the thing he asked for is ready. We cut to Hain, who loathed the waits for inviting him to the Sparka. It was true that the people he had been working with used him as a sacrificial pawn in order to get away from slavers, but in the first place, it had been Hain's own slip of the tongue which had drawn their attention to them. By cursing his comrades, cursing them who had escaped harm, he wanted to justify himself, to protect his own weak, cowardly heart. The Sparka begins as five lizard men enter the arena. Idris shouts out, Idiot. The multitude of gladiators in the audience of the venue were all staring in amazement. The reason for that was clear. There is not five, but six contenders. One of them is Natsuki Schwartz. He declared himself the strongest reinforcement. When Null first heard Subaru's request, his mouth distorted. He felt guilty for having caused such a shock. However, if he were to try and actualize the thing he wished to do, then this was an indispensable thing. He asked if he could create a poison that would kill him. We do not even witness the second Sparka, cutting to Gustav declaring it over, as the unit shouts out about them surviving, or perhaps they had died and went to Ode Laguna. Hyane runs up to Subaru, asking what the hell he was thinking. If you disobey Gustav, you get warned first and punished thereafter. The surviving Lizardman shout out Hyane's name. Subaru looks up at him. This is the chance that he risked his life for. Save her, bro. He stumbles forward, turning back to Schwartz. Thanks, he says, walking up to the men waiting for him in the arena. Tansa comes up behind him, asking him if he wants to die. But there are few who understand the value of life better than he does. She's glad he's okay, but that in itself is a miracle. A miracle, huh? Miracles come from God, but this one is my doing. It was proof he had kicked away such a shitty fate. Subaru is called up to Gustav's office, and the party is left to speculate about why he would enter the second Sparka willfully. Now that you mention it, there's been a rumor about a brat with black hair and black eyes. About how he's the illegitimate son of the Emperor. He stands around in the office with Cecilis, whom Gustav did not allow inside, 
and he responds that he is here because he wants to be. Gustav tells Subaru that he is receiving a warning for his misconduct, and that he was vowed to never speak of leaving the island again. He must pledge to not go against the will of the Emperor. Subaru loudly and proudly announces, I definitely refuse. Cecilius begins to cackle, and Gustav furrows his brow. He has warned him and punished him, yet he still possesses no intention of recanting his words. He agrees because he hates the Empire. Why isn't Gustav punishing Subaru, though? You can use it. The curse rule. On all of us. Use it to make an example out of me. You could do it, but you won't. No, I don't think you can do it. Gustav wants to prevent the gladiators' deaths as much as possible, but he doesn't want them to become insubordinate. Cecilius isn't being punished either. That is another basis for this idea. Gustav is thrust into silence, before saying he will punish him. He will be sent into the next Sparka. Subaru leaves the room and becomes sure of it. The curse rule doesn't truly exist. Tanza calls to Subaru, and she is with the Sparka trio. They begin to inquire about his father. Well, his dad is his idol. He's super cool. Loads of people love him, and he's always at the center of attention. He's got charisma. He has a lot of people depending on him, and his work seems tough too. But he always has time for me and teaches me a lot of things. Subaru felt a sudden surge of warmth behind his eyes and clutched at his chest. It was both joyful and painful to remember his parents. The group then asks him, What is your father's name? That's when he remembers the fake name he is going under, and his childlike brain could process nothing other than, I can't tell you. Tonza's expression stiffened in plain sight, and the Sparka trio began to make a commotion all at once. The silent gladiators erupted into cheers, as the lizard men came to thank Subaru for saving them, but he replied, thank you for saving me too. And so for the first time in three days, he shared with them bone-in meat that was brought out. Multiple days pass, and during that, nothing of note happens on the island. The guards of the island would give Subaru stern looks. Perhaps he had made a mistake in being so open about escaping. Subaru runs into Waits down in the basement, who had come down to help him. He tells Subaru that he isn't interested in the crown he wears. He simply wants to offer his strength. Before the conversation could continue, a tremor hits. The drawbridge is being raised. They meet back up with Tanza to see a carriage rolling out of the island. But something isn't right. The people inside were docile, and the one who stands atop it was none other than the divine general of the Empire, Arakia. Subaru's heart began beating at a tremendous rate, and the sound of blood pumping through his head was explosive. The visitors this time aren't gladiators, but messengers from the Imperial capital. Tanza tries to calm him down. If they are just messengers, then they do not need to be declared enemies immediately. Wait says that they could be here for a morale-raising show, and Subaru wonders if the Emperor would truly care about this place. Hyen is shocked about the prospect of escaping, and Subaru asks him to consider it, but then he suddenly collapses, his eyes bloodshot and toppling sideways. Hyane was motionless. Besides his limbs twitching, he was dying. But he was not the only one. Idra, Waits, and Tanza all lay on the floor, convulsing and trembling. He didn't understand a thing, not a single thing, rendering him unable to react. He crouched next to Tanza's body, tears of blood streaming down her face. The feeling of his head splitting open was about to engulf him. No. Holding his own head, he looked up. Blood trickling from his nose, the ringing in his ears did not stop. He suffered the same pain, but slower. The adjacent common room, the passageways here and there, the main hall, the drawbridge area, everyone in them had met the same fate. With limping feet, flickering eyes, and the contents of his head feeling as if they were melting out of his ears, Subaru looked around the island. Suddenly, unexpectedly, Hey. Subaru turns around, and the same voice asked, What are you doing in a place like this? There stood a man that caused Subaru to freeze instantly. With bright orange hair collected in a bandana, decorated with lines of red, the slender silhouette wore the appearance of an imperial soldier. Both his gentle-looking face and his voice that sounded as if he wanted to be good friends were complete fabrications. The name of the man who fabricated such things was Todd Fang. It was a name that Subaru had called out loud, and Todd asks how he knew his name, before violently flinging Subaru into the wall. I sure don't recognize you. This is a face I don't know. No. You smell like a scary guy I know. Why was Todd on this island was all Subaru could think of. He asks the orange-haired man, why was everyone killed? And Todd says that he can't answer that. You surviving was a miscalculation. If I leave it as is, then it'll just be a matter of time, but I dislike leaving it all up to stuff like that. As Todd's voice whispered close to his ear, something cold pressed against his neck. The blade of the large knife Todd had drawn from his waist. Wait, Todd shouts out. In the midst of the sensation of his consciousness wavering due to his loss of blood, to somehow make use of his last resort, Subaru fumbled his tongue around his molars. Todd thrust his fingers into his mouth, then he dragged it out. Is this... poison? Just what kind of brat are you? To go out of your way to prepare poison in your mouth, that is for committing suicide when you're down on your knees, right? There has gotta be something wrong with you, for you to treat your life like this. 
I guess that's fine, though. It's not like I particularly care if you suffer. Feel free to use it. If you die, then even suicide is fine. Todd shrugs his shoulders, putting the drug back into his mouth. The destination ahead remained unchanged. Subaru bites down hard on his molars, and then, a large quantity of blood filled his mouth, and resolutely, he spit it out towards Todd who stood before him. Feeling vengeful, he thought he could soil his clothes. However, Todd's perception was excellent. He collapses, his whole body screaming. The heat was akin to blood burning. His whole body was boiling, just as if he had been skinned. With only pain, he started wanting to die. Hey, there has got to be something seriously wrong with you, Todd tells the dying boy. While looking at Subaru drowning in a sea of blood, Todd muttered something that Subaru could not understand, asking, if you're using poison to kill yourself, wouldn't you normally prepare one that wouldn't make you suffer? There was a pop, and blood, and his eyes could not see. Subaru resets when Waite says he knows who he is. Whittling away at his whole body was roasting, burning pain. He opened his mouth wide and screamed. Screamed and screamed, trying to expel the poison within him. A deadly poison that would make Subaru suffer, no matter how many times he tasted it. The death brought about by that drug was a reminder to Subaru that there was no easy way to die. The guardian of the last bastion keeping Natsuki Subaru human. Considering Subaru's over-reliant nature, a poison that killed without causing suffering was out of the question. He would immediately think about starting over on something trivial and start relying on the poison's potency. In doing so, Natsuki Subaru would become a monster. After all, my foundation is being a lazy giant idiot. Already, the memory of the time when his arms and legs were fully grown was fading away. Even so, he would not allow his ideals to be twisted any further. That change in nature would be a betrayal to everyone who had accepted Subaru as he was. He could betray himself, but not everyone. Not his family. Even if Natsuki Subaru were to experience hellish pain, he could not withdraw his outstretched hands. Because that was the one tenet that would not bend, even on this gladiator island of isolating waters. Gritting his teeth, he endured the pain that tore his heart to shreds. No, he was not enduring it. The pain to endure had already passed. He had reset. Still, his soul dragged on. Waits' voice trembles as he calls to Subaru who is cowering on the spot, his face smeared with tears and snot. As the shock of dying in the past faded away, he accepted the slow present of being alive. Switching over to an easygoing consciousness happened every time he died from the drug. Surprisingly, it did not come into play very often. Overwhelmingly, he was killed by claws and fangs. However, when he was unable to die, or when he was unsure how to be up to the task in a situation where casualties had been made, he had no choice but to have this drug carry out its purpose. That was the excruciating anguish Natsuki Subaru had to bear. After all, it's my fault for screwing up. Subaru had a responsibility. He tries to raise himself up, crying out about the drawbridge. They're coming, he says. He must not let it happen again. A sense of duty firing up in his chest. Natsuki Subaru's only weapon, the authority of return by death. Ever since coming to Valakia, it had clearly been malfunctioning. The biggest reason that came to his mind was the ongoing infantilization. It seemed the 10 seconds of despair were not given for the sake of saving Subaru, but rather bestowed for the sake of causing him despair. It was not as bad here, but the grace period granted was now unusually short. Possible reasons as to why he survived and nobody else did flashed to his mind. Was it race? Age? Was it because he was from another world? Because of Bayako? Satella? Cecilus pipes up behind Subaru, shocking him for a second. The blue-haired boy says Subaru's face looks like he is worried, and he tells him that something terrible is about to happen, but he can't give him the details. He is delighted there are finally signs of things happening, and Subaru yells out, it's not a joke, and he replies that he welcomes that. Did you truly think I would take your sight unconditionally, Basu? Then he twirls on the spot and outstretches hands. This is undoubtedly the divide. You'd asked if you can get me on your side unconditionally, but allow me to inform you that, at this very moment, you're able to fulfill those conditions. You enthrall me through your premonitions. Connect with me through anticipation. Come along now, O oh wolf pierced by the sword. All you observers who look down upon these harsh and ruthless vast lands, see him clear. In this world, he who is enthralling me, this very Cecilus segment. Without exaggeration, it would be natural to doubt the sanity of the fake Cecilus given his eccentric behavior. No, this isn't the fake. This is the real deal. This bona fide monster truly held faith that he could speak to the world, and that if the world truly possessed a mind of its own, it would be unable to take its eyes off of him. Subaru says he will make Ceci his comrade, and he will work him hard. Cecilus declares that, that impulsiveness, he doesn't dislike it. Rather, he quite likes it. I see, Cecilus says, stroking his chin. His chin onto which blood trickled down from his nose. Well, this sure seems tricky. Concerning this opponent, does there happen to be any shortcomings you're aware of? His state was so awful it was hard to look at. It was frightening, though, that even with blood pouring out from his nose, his tone of voice had not changed in the slightest. However, the scariest thing about Cecile's had not been that. Aren't you afraid of dying? Subaru asks. People die, after all, he responded without hesitation, without bewilderment, without fear. 
without anxiety, without nervousness, without regret. Subaru would repeat the same events as before, wandering around the island looking for survivors until he ran into Todd Fang once again. Only this time, he would flip off the orange-haired man. Subaru knew that if he waited here, he would come. This was a confrontation he could not avoid no matter what. This was his only chance to speak with the Grim Reaper. It was Todd who did this. There was no use asking. Who was still alive? It would be useless to ask. Where was Arakia? It would be useless. What was the method behind the massacre? That is when Subaru heard a voice of a boy who he watched die. Here, right here, he said. He opened his mouth and shouted, The curse rule! The instant he heard that shout, Todd moved. The bothersome air disappeared, leaving only the intent to kill. The thrust of his cold blade buried deep into Subaru's chest. The force of that attack flung his body onto the hard ground, spilling up the drug. It didn't matter. Only one thing mattered. One thing he wanted to say. One thing, he says. Todd's expression changed, giving it precedence above all. He hastily killed Subaru. That was why Subaru had grasped it, and that he died. The curse rule. The curse rule that seemingly didn't exist had been activated, but why was Subaru the only one to outlive it? There was no person to ask, so it wasn't worth brain cells. Precisely because he was correct, Todd had made the decision to kill Subaru in that split second. Immediately after reset, the ground begins to shake as the drawbridge lifts. Of course, he knew this would happen, but the grace period is continually growing shorter. In addition to setting unusual restart points, this time there was a slight discrepancy in time. The grace period had been shortened by 10 seconds. If this continued over and over again, until finally the time to death became less than a second, what would be left for Subaru? What options would he possess? Subaru was with Hyen now, who he tricked into cooperating under false pretenses. The two of them were hiding inside of Gustav's office. Todd and Arakia step in, and Todd hands over a letter from the Prime Minister. Todd says a loathed job such as management of the Gladiator Island isn't suitable for someone such as a blood relative of the hero of Alakia, Kurgan. Gustav cracks open the wax seal and opens the letter. In accordance with the Emperor's wishes, the gladiators are a liability and must be disposed of. Todd tries to empathize. He knows his heart must anguish. The curse rule would be convenient, though. He has a curse tool from Groovy to kill them all. Gustav, however, refuses. The seal of the PM reflects the will of the Emperor. Are you saying you are unable to make a decision? Gustav accepts it as written decree from the PM. The Emperor told me this, however. Even if you receive orders from me, do not disobey the first order. Todd turns to Arakia, saying negotiations have broken down, and Gustav throws his desk at the duo. Before long, though, Arakia fires a jet of water so strong, Gustav's head is pulverized. Todd approaches his corpse, slashing open his back, pulling out the cursed tool. As long as he has this, it doesn't matter if Gustav is alive or dead. Todd puts the cursed tool down on the desk as he asks Arakia to give him some water to wash all of the blood off of him and his knife. That was when Subaru decided it had to be. Arakia opens her mouth in shock, and Todd turns back around as a child is in the middle of the room. Todd's eyes open wide, and the instant Subaru's fingertips touch the tool, he called the hyena. Blow away the whole room, he yells, looking towards the doorway. Todd calls Arakia, but quickly notices it's a bluff. That one second was enough, though, as hyena grabs him and goes out the window. Arakia floods the entire office, but they are already gone. Todd tells her to get the tool, and it's okay to kill. Hyen and Subaru rush to a bush to camouflage inside, because they cannot run from Arakia. She lands in the courtyard, noting they aren't there, but then, she furrows her brow, approaching the bush the two were hiding in. Just before she could reach them, the atmosphere was disturbed by the voices of multiple men. Todd calls out from a destroyed office. Gustav Morello has been killed. The two killers are a black-haired child and a gray lizard man. Kill them as soon as possible. Arakia looked up at him, and their eyes met, and Todd silently pointed at the courtyard below. For a moment, Subaru's heart palpitated, but Todd was not pointing at them. He was pointing at the gladiators, the heavenly lifeline that had appeared in the courtyard at the last second. Todd then brought that very finger to his neck, and kill them. While his voice had been inaudible, even Subaru could tell his lips moved as to speak those words. She swung her arm holding the branch. That was all she did. Some had their heads burst from the inside, some died because the contents of their heads spilled out. More gladiators approached hearing Todd's voice. The number of victims of the Spirit Eater of Arakia would increase. Hence, it commenced. A massacre on the island. Alongside Arakia's rampage, the island's gladiator beasts were unleashed upon the island, as guards patrolled the corridors looking for Schwartz. Subaru and Hyane, finding an opening, dashed to the healing room to recover Tanza. She was beside a witch beast corpse, but that beast had killed a person. The cadaver of a feeble old man, who was nothing more than skin and bones, rested at her feet. Idra and Waits enter as well, and they ask Subaru if the rumors are true, but he denies. Arakia did it, alongside someone scarier than a Sin Archbishop. If things continued at this rate, the gladiators, who were still losing their lives, would remain dead in a world that would live on. That was something unbearable. Hyene says that in this case, you should stop hiding it. Hiding what, he asks. Waits tells him to stop, but Idra affirms. It's time to come forth with it. Your father. 
Subaru says that he's just a salary man, though, but they deny that Schwartz is the Emperor's illegitimate son. It's being talked about outside the island. For someone of such a young age, your judgment, command, and survival are unimaginable. Tanza chimes in. You were accompanying Abel in Chaos Flame. Right now, a rebel army has been raised against the Emperor, and the one considered to be the leader of that rebellion is the Emperor's illegitimate son. It made sense, and he could envision just who concocted that, and how they had done it. That bastard, Subaru whispers. It was a means to find him. Sensing the turning of tides, Todd stroked his chin. What an unsettling feeling. He really didn't want to come to a place like this. He wanted to be reassigned, but he had been appointed as the sole subordinate of Arakia, someone who had no underlings previously. All that was because of one singular lie he had told to deceive Arakia. Even now, Jamal continues to be a pain in the ass to Todd Fang. This should be an easy task, yet an unforeseen incident had happened. When it comes to killing people of higher rank, he can think of numerous ways, but a child? Nothing about it felt nice, and he doubted he would have a whole lot of opportunities to employ them. Both the Rebellion and Garal and Chaos Flame were nothing but an irritating racket. He cared not if the apex of the Empire changed, as long as it became a better place to live. And if it did not change, he was fine with the way it was. That reminds him of something detestable. The matter of Todd recalling the Rebellion caused a terrifying being to flash through his mind. A child of war, who loved war and was loved by war. He would rather that he had died during a battle, but he did wonder what happened to him. That is when someone with a high-pitched voice yelps his name, and before his eyes was the boy who was being chased by the entire Gladiator Island. Subaru had walked straight up to Todd, surrounded by the Sparka Trio and Tanza, and Todd tells him, you're not invincible because you've got friends. Subaru demands Todd surrender. He raises an eyebrow. Why should he? During this, he signals with his hands to the two guards near him. A single reason. The cursed tool is in Subaru's possession. He calls it a bluff, though. Worthless bargaining. But Subaru willingly pulls it out to show it off. If it were Todd, he would definitely hide it somewhere on the island to use its whereabouts as a bargaining chip. Todd tries to doubt the orb, asking Subaru to use it. Tanza tells him to listen up. If you hail from outside the island, you have heard about this boy. This gentleman right here is the one at the heart of the situation shaking the Empire, who has stood up to correct the arid ways of the Empire. He is the son of His Excellency the Emperor, Vincent Valakia, Natsuki Schwartz. The guards gulped, their complexion changed. Todd noticed this as well. He reached to grab his axe, swinging it towards the guard beside him. One of their heads fell off, while the others cracked and slammed against the wall. Todd punted the fallen head forward as far as he could, soaring towards the boy, causing the guard's witch beasts to follow in an attack. Waits Rogan had never believed he could live or die honestly. Either way, the thing called society tended to undervalue the word normal. Normal was employed to convey the meaning of average or ordinary, but from the viewpoint of those that were less than human, it was an unreachable standard. He had thought that since he had been alone since birth, it was natural to be alone upon death. When suspicions arose that materials stock from the workshop he frequented were being sold through illegal channels, Waits had been the first one to come under suspicion. He had zero means to clear those suspicions. He was tried for a crime he had no memory of committing, and the first tattoo inked onto him was evidence of his punishment, to be recognized as one from a glance. Once this occurred, he could no longer live the same life. That was when he gave up on the idea of being normal. He turned to thievery to earn his daily income. In short, his supposed sin had now caught up with reality. The tattoos which only laid on his forearms now covered most of his body. One day, he got surrounded by city guards after retaliating against a man who had falsely accused him, biting his ear off and spitting it out. That was when he crossed the lake. I don't care what happens. I ain't got any intention of dying. No matter who I must sacrifice, no matter who I must outsmart, I'll survive. And then one day, one day I'd be treated as... Wait, grab the sword. I'm counting on you, a young boy would yell out. I'd be treated as a normal human being. That was my wish. The moment the head tossed by Todd headed towards them, he pushed Schwartz out the way. The gladiator beast had charged in, destroying the wall of the passageway. While his back was showered with wounds from fragments of the wall bursting open, Waits did not take his eyes off Todd. He was dangerous. Todd ruthlessly narrowed his eyes, and just from that, Waits could tell his opponent intended on killing him. Todd raised his arm, and so too did Waits. At the moment of impact, Waits' elbow bones were shattered, but he endured it. The unification of that grit and judgment had been the result of encountering a child far more reckless than himself. He tries to grab Todd with his remaining right arm, but at that moment, his form vanishes. No, he didn't vanish. He had just become unable to see it, just as if something had suddenly crushed the right side of Waits' vision. He turned around, seeing the head of the witch beast from earlier, sent flying from the swing of the axe. Beyond that, he sees the figures of the four people behind. It was the first time anyone said that they believed in me. Understanding that, he lost the strength in his legs, collapsing right then and there. Subaru tries to rush to his side, but Tanza holds onto him with tears in her eyes and shaking her head. She would not let him be impulsive. Right overhead, the collapsed weights. The passageway succumbed to the weight and collapsed with a violent screech. Waits' body would be engulfed, and the floor gave out.
Subaru screamed as he reached his hand out towards the falling passage. Waits died saving him. Quickly, he must quickly save him. Todd mutters that which beasts are a pain to kill. Everything happened too fast for Subaru to think. He could not digest any of what had just unfolded. Witch beasts will eat the corpse of the guy who broke their horn, Todd says. They will listen to commands, but resentment slowly accumulates. Disgusting, isn't it? He sure looked like a guy who cared for his companions. That's why he died, Todd says. But this seems out of character. Without listening to anyone, notifying anyone, explaining to anyone, to kill without giving any information whatsoever. That was Todd's way of doing things. Why had he spoken incessantly, allowing them to hear all that just now? Subaru's mind moves on to the next question. Waits. Waits should not have died. While facing the horror that was Todd, he should not have attempted to protect Subaru and the others. Todd, looking down at Subaru who yells out, says that his expression finally started to look like a brat's. Subaru's head was filled with regret and impatience the second he understood that Waits had died. Todd smirks, raising his axe overhead. The purpose of Todd's explanation was to let Subaru put his thoughts in order, forcing him to confront Waits' death, which he had tried not to think about. Had been so that his heart would be crushed, in order to turn an enigmatic enemy into a human being. Tanza calls to Subaru, standing in front of him and protecting him from Todd. However, he frowns at her conduct, responding that she is doing it all wrong. Todd drops to his knees on the spot, hoisting her up and throwing her body out of the large hole in the wall created by the giant bird. Todd tells her to have fun, as her screams quickly faded. Thus, there was no one left to protect Subaru and the others from Todd's axe. Idris says that this is the Emperor's son, are you insane? However, Todd's answer to that complaint was simple. He swung his axe to bash Idris' head in. Just before he could die, Idra collapses to his butt. The axe missed and landed behind him, while Subaru yanked him down and shook his head hastily. It was impossible. Words would not get through to him. The threat itself had been a mistake. Subaru had tried to rely on taking the easy way out. Readjusting the grip on his axe, Todd turned to the side with a disgusted expression. Hyen had camouflaged himself against the surrounding scenery. Disappearing right in front of me, Todd says. Hyen flinched. His camouflage was instantly disrupted. He hit him in the shoulder with his axe, cleaving through his chest, and he collapsed, as his blood profusely flowed out of him. Waits had died, Taza was thrown away, and Hyen had been killed as well. I it's a duel, Idra mutters. If you two are a warrior, but Todd wasn't. He attacked during his unpreparedness. I am not a warrior, I am a soldier. Lodged in Idra's throat was Todd's knife. He asked Subaru, are you really the child of the Emperor? Subaru then understood why he was still alive. The lie had driven a wedge into Todd. I've decided that it's always better to inquire about the authenticity of a matter when the situation's in my favor. It is your name I am curious about, Natsuki Schwartz. Those words barely escape Subaru's trembling lips. That's similar to the name of a scary guy I know. And to top it off, the way you smell is really similar to that guy as well. Do you know about the miasma? Huh? No. Your body odor. It really does smell. Do you have an older brother or something? If so, I'd keep you alive as a bargaining chip. Todd keeping someone alive was a path Subaru never expected to be able to take. Waits, Hein, and Idra had died right next to him. If he closed his eyes, he could see the deaths of Gustav and Null. He could see the deaths of so many gladiators. Thus, because Subaru must absolutely not die, he looks up, eyes bent on changing the tide of the situation, and meekly puts out, You know about my brother? Wait. Hey, you tried to manipulate me, didn't you? With a dull thud, a sharp sensation slid into his chest. Feeling the chill of the blade inside his body, Subaru widened his eyes. Then, one beat later, a pain so great that his limbs went numb screamed into the back of his head with potency. Due to that potent scream, Subaru's own mouth also screamed. My bad, my bad. There is no room for carelessness or weakness. Coughing violently, a red-stained package fell out of his mouth. It didn't matter. It no longer mattered. It was not like he could use it. Die. He must not die. If he died, it would be terrible. Todd steps on Subaru's abdomen as he raises his axe overhead. I must not die. Weakly, he raised his hands to shield his head until Todd's axe pulverized what remained. He reset to when Waits gets killed, his body collapsing to its side. Even if he were to extend his hand, no matter what he did, his body could not be saved anymore. He should not have died. Subaru should not have died. Once it happened that someone could not be saved, Natsuki Subaru's heart would be shattered. The sound of footsteps steadily approaching paralyzed Subaru's heart. The prevention of the massacre from Todd and Arakia's arrival was absolutely mandatory. This time, what Subaru feared was not death itself. Rather, he feared that upon meeting his death and returning, reality would become absolute. That a life he could not save would carry over was what he feared the most. At the scene before him, of Waits' collapse in bloody form, his throat shrieked, screaming as he tried to run away. Tanta forbade him. The same scene, the same scene he had witnessed just a minute ago, he observed it once more. 
As the rubble pours down, Subaru escapes Tanza's hand, sprinting towards the place into which Waits was falling. Subaru was met head-on by something swinging to mow him down. Only after a hard, heavy sound emanated did he realize it had been the blade of an axe. Reset. One second later, Waits' figure collapsed. The reality that could not be undone had crushingly trampled upon the soul of Natsuki Subaru. Sneaking into Gustav's office, he had learned the truth of the massacre. Many times they were discovered before Todd and Arakia's conversation would occur. Mistakes accrued, repeating through trial and error for the sake of the next loop. It had become irreversible. The restart point would move to Gustav's office. When Gustav's head blew off, he knew he absolutely could not die. If he died and returned to a past where Gustav had been killed, it would become absolute. If he made anybody's death absolute, then that was tantamount to Subaru killing them himself. Natsuki Subaru would be the murderer. He fell to his knees as Hain was killed. He was left all alone again. What's actually happening here, Todd asks, but Subaru finishes his sentence, asking if he's the child of the Emperor. Todd tells him to stop predicting what people are going to say. Subaru says that if he doesn't want to die, stay put, pulling out the black ore from his pocket. Todd pipes up, but Subaru screams at him to shut up. He's talking. Todd let out a small sigh and raised his hands. Using the knowledge from Abel was a mistake. He should have used this from the start. Because of that, he ruined everything. Gustav, Null, Waits, Tanza, all because of Subaru. All because he could not make proper use of his head. He kicked Subaru's hand, causing the orb to fly overhead. He gazes up to follow it with his eyes, only to be met with Todd's axe in his throat. He was unable to conceive of a way to stop Todd Fang. Idra had come from a small farming village, where they had kept a family mill business. Him and his father were sternly told that the world looks harshly on millers, and it was important to be humble never monopolizing wealth, sharing joys and sorrows with those around them. This was not the Valikian way, but it was the way of this remote rural village. Idra grew up with these benefits, so even after his ill father handed over the family business early on, he had tried to keep the tradition alive. Idra became close with a man who visited the village every few months, exchanging stories from the outside world. As he tells him, he is interested in his cousin. Without hesitation, Idra introduced them. A month later, that man conspired to steal the family business. He insisted that Idra's cousin was entitled to run the business, and spoke further lies that Idra and his father, who had been working at the mill until now, had falsified the results of their milling. It was untrue, but the suspicion attached to the profession of a miller could not be dispelled. Before a settlement could be reached, Idra's very ill father died. Then, his mother, suffering from heartache, passed away. He would plead innocence, but no one would believe him. Deprived of his family business and reduced to slavery, Idra was sent to the island. Isn't it enough already? How can I still be motivated to work hard? Everyone is looking to take advantage of everyone else. If that is the case, there is nothing wrong with him doing that as well. He had no trained strength, nor any ability to be of use. Who would choose Idra? That is when Subaru called to him. The day for him to be rewarded for living an honest life was not supposed to arrive. Idra felt a throbbing sensation in his head, completely unable to move. Fear. He could no longer avoid facing it. As Waits died and Tanza was thrown out, Idra stiffened. It would be too ironic if that cowardice was the reason that he would be able to outlive Waits and Tanza. Everyone on the island would be killed. Schwartz is the son of the Emperor. Waits and Tanza are dead. Was this all a dream? You've done a bold thing, you know. Idra stiffened in horror, forgetting the pain in his body as he heard a cold voice, footsteps approaching. It's better than standing still, but that's what happens when you jump off without a plan. But that fed-up voice was not directed at Idra. He looks up, and saw the crawling form of a ragged, bloodied, black-haired boy. He had clung onto the waist of Idra and Hyane, jumping out of a hole in the wall. Neither the crawling Schwartz nor the collapsed Idra could escape the man. Hyane was nowhere in sight. Either he didn't make it or he used his camouflage. Either way, he could not be relied on. Perhaps, if Todd was paying attention to Schwartz, he too would be overlooked as having died. It was time to choose. In order to survive, what would Idra Misanka sacrifice? In this cruel world, where the strong and cunning got whatever they wished, just what kind of person would Idra choose to become? One, two... And three. He raised the axe, gripping it with both hands, about to kill Schwartz. Holding his breath, shutting his eyes, forcing his whole body to move. Tearing it off from the ground, it seemed to stick onto. He ran clumsily. He ran and threw himself onto Todd's back. He says that he knew he was alive, as if to mock Idra's resolve, dropping his axe and pulling out a knife. In a flash, Idra's right forearm was blown off from the elbow. Take him and go, Idra shouted. Todd clicks his tongue and turns around, throwing the knife, aiming at Schwartz, but... He was no longer there. Hyen had taken him and started running. Idra throws himself onto Todd's back, biting down onto his clothes. He was struck in the chest by an elbow, and he was kicked to the ground, landing beside Todd's axe. Todd asks if he didn't think that he escaped. Idra says he did think, but he hoped that he hadn't. Idra had foolishly and honestly believed that Hyen would not escape and leave them. 
Even if they pointed and laughed at him for being a good person, Idra would become neither a warrior nor a fraud. Brandishing the axe with his left hand, while shedding blood, he shouted, I am Idra Misanga, the son of a miller. Never heard of him, Todd replies. He was glad that, thanks to Schwartz, he had not become a liar on that day. Subaru digs his nails in a hyena. They both look like a mess. He lost his strength and fell forward, them both tumbling across the stone floor. Listlessly lying prone, Hyen had a large knife stuck deep into his back. It's strange, he says. I once heard that life is like a flower. You pick the beautiful one first. If that's the case, it's strange that someone with a fucked up personality like me would die first. Subaru crawled and crawled so he could pull him up, who was drowning in his own blood. And yet, he could not move his body forward, not even a little. Everyone was dead. Subaru had as good as killed them. Was it blood, tears, or snot that was soling his face? He didn't understand anything anymore. Oh, is that you, Basu? What a coincidence to meet at a scene like this. Things have gotten quite lively. Doesn't it excite you? He walked in front of Subaru for him, with the left half of his body scorched black. The blue lightning was smiling carefree. Cecilus walked up to Subaru, talking about death as if it was frivolous, causing intense rage to boil within him. He adds he is busy, though. He is in the middle of a showdown with Arakia. He says he's getting cooked. Subaru asks, Why? Why are you enjoying this? At the end of this agonizing struggle, the venting of his anger rushed forth from his mouth. Cecilus's smile was revolting. What was so amusing? I'm not smiling because it's enjoyable. I'm smiling to make the situation of this play more enjoyable. Everyone is in pursuit of their own ideal happiness. The myriads of different people in existence, the philosophies they each follow, that pursuit remains constant in all of them. The faith I herald is the reason behind this way of being. I am the leading actor of this world, therefore, I am not going to adhere to the script. Rather, the script will adhere to me. That is why I smile. That is when the intermission ends, as Arakia descends. Still, his smile does not vanish. Her eye patch was missing. Covering her eye with her left hand, her face contorts yelling out Cecilia's name. Wings of flame dance from her back. The force of their blaze wavered as if in tandem with her emotions. Subaru stands up with the last of his strength, and with a reason unbeknownst to him, he runs. If he ran faster, could he save them? He didn't resist or struggle, but flee. He could not make the excuse that it was a strategic withdrawal or a valiant escape to follow up next time. There was nothing more to follow up on. Everybody had died. He was unable to do anything whatsoever. He wanted to surmount every hardship, a mistaken presumption. If he were really a capable person, he should have made everything turn out well. Dying not even a single time. Just as though he were that dreadful existence. Just as though he were Todd Fang. Without even possessing the authority to start over, he surmounted every situation through his own power. Todd was identical to Subaru. He lacked any outstanding fighting strength, so then why? Why was Subaru unable to do the same things as Todd? His small fist, his non-functioning mind, his useless authority. Were he to start enumerating the reasons for his defeat, what came to mind was unending. Just what did he, this shitty brat with scary eyes, possess? Schwartz. Tonza barely cried out. Subaru barely stifling a scream. She laid there, destroyed with her horn broken. She's glad he's alright. One someone would expect to cling to an adult and cry had stumbled upon Natsuki Subaru. He could not do anything at all. The strength in his legs sapping away. He sank to the floor. The noise in his head went silent. It was not relief that Tanzo was alive, nor that he had shaken off his fear of Todd. Merely, he had run out of patience with himself. Seeing this, Tanzo rushes to his side, her white juban being dyed red. Despite having sustained a wound seemingly of immense pain, she was still worrying about Subaru. When he realized he could not live up to any of Tanza's expectations, he lost all strength. Resignation had overwhelmed his inner heart. That which dealt despair to Natsuki Subaru was not something as easy to understand as hardship. He had been unable to meet the expectations, the wishes placed upon him. That, above everything else, was what brought Natsuki Subaru a despair that had become deadly poison to him. Tanza says they have to save Idra and Hyene, but no. They died. They died protecting me. Tanza was hurt protecting me. Everyone dying was my fault. Everyone being killed was Subaru's fault. The tragedy that had befallen the Gladiator Island, all of it was Natsuki Subaru's fault. Tanza pleads with him to get up, to not let them die in vain, but they already had. Subaru had lied to them. I'm not the Emperor's child. Her round eyes widened further. That was natural. It was a lie that made Subaru want to curse his very self. If he were killed by Tanza, that was something unavoidable. The same went for everyone else. The chance to exact rightful punishment on the deceitful Subaru had been lost by those he had deceived. But she doesn't do anything like that. She wants to help him escape, to put him on her back. Did you hear me? It was a lie, he yells at her, as if begging for her to attack him. Do you truly believe that they died out of loyalty to the Empire, Schwartz? 
as a scaredy cat, Hyen had tried to run away so he could save himself. As a coward, Waits had struggled to survive by outmaneuvering those around him. As a liar, Idra had tried to make himself look bigger so as to be able to control everyone. It wasn't because he was the Emperor, it was because they were close. She understands how they felt. She too was once rescued by Yorna. Subaru takes offense, not for himself, but for Yorna. Being compared to Subaru Natsuki, she deserved far more than that. Even disrespect had its limits. I wanted to save everyone. You have saved them, to the extent that they would stake their lives in order to protect you. Perchance, Subaru had saved the hearts of those three, but just their hearts was not enough. What he wanted to save was everything. Were he unable to do so, then he would be no son of Natsuki Kenichi. No, I hate it. With him hopelessly bawling out, this world was ending. Before he knew it, the Gladiator Island was engulfed in black smoke. Its tongues of flames spread, bringing the lives carried with it to an end. I won't permit anything of the sort. I don't want to allow anything of the sort. I don't want my knees to buckle because of an end like this, unable to save everyone. I cannot accept an ending like this, with everyone sacrificing their lives. I cannot accept it. Therefore, I don't want to lose to you. I don't care about stuff like winning or losing, though. As Todd appears with an axe in his hand, his hair hanging down. He had lost his bandana, giving an entirely separate aura from the man from before. He says that Subaru must have the devil's luck for lasting this long. He is impressed with Tanz's look as she grabs a rock telling him to stop coming forward. He runs his hand through his hair. This is the only mark of Idra. He did not injure him, all he did was snatch his bandana, and that was enough for Todd to exercise caution. Tanz asks what it is he wants and he says, to go home. Subaru talks her down, she doesn't need to speak to him, he will do any talking. Todd says he has nothing to talk about, and he asks if he is scared of a kid this close to death. It sure is scary. A brat still trying to provoke me in this situation? Being scared is unavoidable. Subaru also considered something else. Todd was someone who cautiously used his wits and did not overestimate his own ability. Such a way of doing things was... You're someone who tries to manage everything all on your own. It's impossible to do everything. Subaru responds, Although you came alongside Arakia's comrades, you really don't trust her in the slightest. It wasn't because he didn't trust Arakia's strength, it was simply because he didn't care about her. It wasn't just her, but everything around Todd. That was why his thoughts, his actions, his ideals, all were fulfilled entirely by his own self. I don't want to lose to a guy of that sort. My defeat wouldn't be just mine, but Tanz's, Hyane's, Waits, Idra's, and everyone in my units. That was absolutely loathsome. That was why he would win. Kneeling, his body close to death, Subaru put a hand on his own chest. He did not move. He would not move. There was just one thing he had to say. I can return by death. Powering through his slight hesitation, Subaru spoke so. After an instant of nothing, because of Subaru's words, Todd wrinkled his brow. What? Were he to speak that, without fail, a disaster should befall Subaru. That did not arrive. For what reasons? The witch had lost sight of Subaru. Instinctively, unconsciously, Subaru had understood that. Even during Sparka, even when the witch beasts were released on the island, and they did not rush towards Subaru. It was made certain that he had been parted from the witch. He shouts it over and over. This was something he must not reveal to anyone. He did not stop it from reaching Taz's ears either. Raising his eyes to the heavens, Subaru projected his voice towards the same overcast skies black smoke was ascending to. With his body in tatters, his resolve was settled. May it be so the observers did not feel shame. Those were the rambling words left behind by Cecilus. They likely did not envision the same thing, yet those thoughtless remarks had aided him in realizing. There was something that was observing Subaru. Were it watching him even now, without parting from him, then these loops bereft of hope, bereft of love, would not come to pass. I can return by death. I'm right here. Come find me. I know it's selfish, but I want to save everyone. With my, with Natsuki Subaru's authority, and nothing more. It just isn't enough. That's why, come find me, Satella. The world lost color, the loud throbbing that resounded vanished into the distance. Donning a dress weaved from jet black shadows, the witch he yearned for appeared before his eyes. Moving through his chest, repeating, I love you, her fingertips wrap around his heart. He had longed for it all. As the world regained color, the sensation of his limbs returned. Todd immediately understood the situation had changed, as witch beasts all around the island roared. At that instant, casting his mind back to the sense of crisis, Todd immediately detected Subaru as the cause. Without haste, he moved to kill, as Tanza throws the stone at the center of his mass. It hit his left arm, but he instead moved to kill Tanza. Subaru pushed her out the way taking her spot. Todd's pupils flutter, and suddenly, he flies into the air and lands on his ass. His mouth bleeding, his knees about to buckle, Todd looks around anxiously. Thrusting his finger towards Todd, Subaru mutters, Invisible Providence. Next, I'll blow your head off. 
He withdraws his finger and flips off Todd. Todd, noting the situation has become unfavorable, flees into the black smoke. As Subaru collapses, having used the authority of Sloth, Tanza rushes over, tears flowing, trying to save Subaru. An axe lodged in his shoulder and multiple broken bones, he accepts his death, handing Tanza the cursed tool. Tanza had treated him kindly just before. She had remedied just about all of Subaru's thoughts. That Natsuki Subaru was, until the end of the end, someone better off not giving up. She had aided him in remembering so. He mutters, next time. She widened her eyes, wrapping her hand around his. Yes, that is correct, Schwartz. Next time, without a doubt, we will not lose. I will save everyone. With that resolve on his final moment, the life of Natsuki Subaru burned to ashes. A world of utmost darkness. Nothing but darkness existed in this place. The darkness he could not stand a chance against by his lonesome was engulfing everything, taking away everything. Even if he was being tortured by the feeling of helplessness, abandoning everything in his vicinity, even himself, the feeling of defeat that originated from being unable to do anything anymore had scorched his body. I love you. It may not be everything, but I know. The things he could accomplish by his lonesome were not that numerous. He was not a human being ambitious to such an extreme extent. That was why he could also make mistakes. I love you. I know that as well. I really do. I know. Having parted ways, it was something he knew at last. Thank you. I'll be heading off now. To that place, to that land of isolating waters, where all life had been wiped out. For the sake of losing no longer. For the sake of not allowing those he held dear to be trampled upon. Once more. Natsuki Subaru would rise once more. He resets to the start of Phase 6, repeating all of the events of the phase, but this time convincing everyone on the island, Gustav included, to follow him due to being the son of the Emperor. The one who wins is us. You will notice I didn't do much analysis for a bit now, because I feel like this entire section just kind of has to be digested before diving in. There is a lot, and I mean a lot, to talk about. First things first, what was wrong with Return by Death? Well, Satella was no longer playing an active role. If that was during infantilization, or the start of Arc 7, or Arc 5, I'm not entirely certain. However, the end of this phase introduces the idea that Satella wouldn't even respond to the taboo, something she did prior in this very arc, and not even that long ago. That means something had to have happened between the last invocation of the taboo and the time it didn't activate. So, let us try to pinpoint a few of the major events between then and now. Number one is further mental degradation. This would fit with my prior theory that the infantilization has caused Satella to lose sight of who Subaru is, and it would also potentially explain why Al completely lost his authority. Similar things happened, but since Subaru was at least sort of in Satella's gaze, Return by Death still functioned, just without the intervention of Satella to make it more powerful. Not entirely impossible, worth considering. Number two is the teleport to Geenenhive. Uh, considering the teleport to Valakia may not have broken Return by Death, I think this one's unlikely. And finally, Luis's authority reactivating. Now, this is a big one that I only considered while writing this script. Subaru's loops have been short since post-Arc 4, but when they become completely unstable and near impossible to work with was when Luis regained her authority. I don't remember if I talked about this in a video, or a stream, or just on Discord because it's impossible to keep track of all the phase videos I've made at this point, but at some point somewhere, I talked about how, obviously, Satella was not very happy when Luis popped out because she knew about Return by Death. Perhaps this is just the effect of the Gluttony Authority returning, and that made Satella lose sight of Subaru more than she had before. This could work in conjunction with the first point, but I'll let you guys decide below. There are two major things to talk about, and the first is Subaru's character in Phase 6. I think it's really cool that even though his mind has regressed like this, he has held absolutely firm onto this idea of him being connected to death like that, always remembering that death is not a trivial thing or a game you can play, and it's one thing that nobody can sway him on, the value of life and humanity. To be frank, I think his total success at Geenenhive is worrying. I went into this arc, if you guys remember, looking to see Subaru's naive perspective of being able to save everyone at all times challenged, and it was for a long time, but I also don't think that Subaru only taking L's is a good thing either, because he deserves to win sometimes, because his goal is admirable. And I think straddling that line of caring about himself and saving as many people as he can is a tough line to walk. While I am skeptical of where Phase 6 leaves Subaru off at, considering Infantilization is still playing an active role in Arc 7, and I assume Arc 8 since it's been dogged by everyone and their moms since Arc 7 Part 2, there is plenty of time for this to cook, and I won't write off that entire plot point before it's done. Additionally, Subaru's reckless behavior and racking up as many deaths as Al would on any given Thursday gives me a good sign that what he was doing is not sustainable, and Subaru having a poison that deeply hurts him was really just great. Phase 6 also represents this ideology that is sort of at odds with Subaru's hate for the Empire, describing himself as the center of the world that will trample upon others as the strongest existence, embodying the Valakian ideal itself of might makes right, the strong trampling the weak. Return by death might be fixed, but Subaru still isn't, and he is succumbing to the Valakian way. Besides that, I really enjoyed the recontextualization of Shala's quote, the one who wins is you line from Arc 6, as he stretches it to include everyone, saying the one who wins is us. 
It was also nice to see him talk about that, considering Subaru and Cecilos having this discussion all phased long about not relying on others or finding strength with others. We see where it gets them, as Cecilos is basically getting washed the entire time and Subaru desperately tries to use the strength of others to attain victory. There was just one person on that list he was forgetting to borrow strength from, Satella. RBD before being reunited with Satella was explicitly stated to be something out of self-flagellation, not out of love. It could be similar to Al's authority, in that without Satella's love, Subaru got a much more dangerous and volatile version of the authority he had prior, because that was the authority that he has, with no Satella involvement. And it would fit, considering that Subaru loves to, you know, fuck himself up. I think of all of the Cecilus content I have read thus far, this was the best, uh, serving as a very interesting ideological enemy for Subaru, and talking all of that random bullshit was cool. Uh, despite being his best, I still do not understand the massive fan hype for this character, he hasn't really done much except be called the strongest, lose fights, and now this content, which like I said, was good. Todd and Subaru single-handedly carried this phase, and Todd didn't even appear for quite a lot of it, so unfortunately, a lot of this phase was with a cast that wasn't very compelling for me. Subaru calling out Todd on being someone who refuses to rely on others because he doesn't trust them led to a very fascinating furthering of the foil of Todd and Subaru. He had already paralleled Subaru's idea of doing anything for the one he loves to an extreme extent. In Phase 6 and other side stories, he showed how much he mirrors the old aspect of Subaru not relying on other people, and Subaru gets to claim victory over Todd by accepting help from everyone including the one he so desperately didn't want to for so long. For the first time outside of Katya, we get a glimpse into Todd's... morality? It feels weird to phrase it that way. However, uh, killing a child is something that he had really not actively thought about. He daydreams about killing those around him, but the ways to kill a child are something that had not crossed his mind. Todd is largely a consequence of a might-makes-right society, the logical end of true meritocracy. Ironically, a far more realistic depiction of a product of war than the character of Natsumi he is so afraid of. In a society like Valakia, a place that is a hotbed of war and conflict, the degradation of humanity is the next logical step. To always feel that people's lives are simply a means to an end. You might even be able to argue that he is an inverse to Subaru in that way as well, where Subaru sometimes refuses to take himself into account and uses his own body as a tool to save others, Todd only thinks of himself and Katya, and the people around him are the tools to use. Okay, let's talk about the big thing I'm assuming everyone has been waiting for me to talk about. The reset. I'm not necessarily huge on it. I don't hate it, but I don't like it. My issue isn't with one big reset, right? ReZero has had some pretty lengthy resets before. I mean, Volume 23 had a pretty long loop in it, so I don't think it is the resetting of the long loop itself. It is one of two things. The first being that Hyen, Waits, and Idra all got pretty neat character conclusions that showed them being the opposite of what they were initially introduced as, and secondly, they died with the story repeatedly, and I mean repeatedly hammering home that this was a permanent death. Now, I still saw some form of reset coming, personally, but just because you can see something coming or something is foreshadowed doesn't automatically make it good. Subaru was in a situation he had never been in before, where he was in summertime rendering, and if he is too reckless, someone will be dead forever due to it, and he got there. Gustav and the Gienenhive trio were completely dead. The issue with the reset, in my opinion, is that it goes on to permanently harm the sense of stakes one might feel in the series. We had permadeaths dangled in front of us only for them to be ripped away, and not even ripped away for great characters. Don't get me wrong, the trio is fine, but Taipei created a situation where the permadeaths were either 1. Unsatisfying as it was a trio of characters introduced this very phase to die, or 2. It feels like we were cheated because everything got undone at the end of the day. I don't personally fear this setting a precedent of Satella undoing any really bad loop, I think this could be a one-off thing, but I also couldn't blame people for being fearful of the greater consequences. It's not that people are necessarily worried about this literal reset event repeating itself, it's more so a meta-criticism, worried that the story would do such a thing to undo consequences again. However, the Great Reset has introduced my next big theory. Of course, even now, I am still thinking about Aldebaran. We have wondered for a long time why there was some confusion with Al when it comes to the Ram and Ram thing, as well as what inspired him to pick himself back up and leave Geenenhive. What if Al experienced his own I Know reset? Perhaps Al was mad about Ram being alive, and had already knew her name because in the timeline where he reset from, one of them was dead by this point. If you think about Arc 2, if Subaru didn't come in and mess around with the events, Ram or Ram might have been killed, and that information is what sets off Al in Arc 3. Whatever happened to the big reset that Al wanted to prevent, things are now possibly off course due to one man and one man only, and despite initial frustration, Al now wants to stick with Subaru in reaching his goal, to shift the timeline that he feared and reset from. Perhaps when Al said, so that's what it is, when he found out Ram was alive, that was him understanding that somebody else was looping and shifting the timeline around. That is my Al reset theory, but let's go ahead and wrap up the video because it's far, far too long already. Subaru's character moments were great, and I enjoyed the blending of identities. Todd was fucking fantastic, Jesus Christ, I love him. And when Subaru hit it with Invisible Providence, I was bouncing up and down in my chair. However, the Gideon Hive characters were not strong enough to carry an entire book, and the reset has its issues. Thank you for sticking through this absurdly long phase video.
Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for the funny YouTube algorithm. You can check the description down below to follow me on Twitter, where I'm objectively correct all the time. Uh, you can also join my Discord, where we talk about My Hero Academia, ReZero, Jujutsu Kaisen, and stuff like that. And you can also now become a YouTube member, which basically just gives you access to behind-the-scenes content, a little badge on comments and live stream chats, and access to some emotes. Only do so if you want to support the channel, though. But that's about it, though. Thank you for watching. See ya.